Welcome to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Father, we want to see Jesus. We pray that through your word we might see him and get to know him so that we enjoy him more, love him more, and share your love for your world. In his glorious name, amen. Okay, here's the plan. All day today, any moment I've got, I want to speak to you about Jesus. I've come quite a long way to do that. Many of you have come a long way as well. So I don't want to play a game here. It's not just going to be patter. I want something to happen today. Because I know that all is not well with your life. Some of you are very aware of that. Some of you are hurting. You're bewildered, grieved. Some of you, you're not actually aware that you're broken. Um, You might be fooling others. You may even be fooling yourself. But the reality is we're all broken in various different ways. Yes, and I want you to see the comfort of Jesus for where you're at. And I think in in a setup like this, I think it's particularly easy. We sing these songs and you look around and you feel like you're the one who's the hypocrite. You're the one with the secret problem. You're the odd one out. Some of you, it's not so much you're feeling a hypocrite, you're just feeling spiritually cold, just a bit bored. Maybe it's that you know the gospel so well, you've trotted it out for years, that you're kind of bored with it. Maybe just so bored of everything that bluntly the only thing you think about now is yourself. And so you spend your life in front of the mirror, literally or not, preening for the world. That's what you're really interested in. I want to speak to the real you today. I want to show you Jesus is for you where you are at right now. And I want you to know that so surely, how the comfort and glory of Jesus applies to you. Yes, you, wherever you're at, how it applies to you, so that by the end of the day, you could look those around you square in the eye and say with Paul in Philippians 3, whatever I considered profit, I now consider loss For the sake of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Indeed, I consider everything a loss next to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. A big part of that means that I want to shift you away from seeing Christianity as mere duty, merely what is correct to enjoying Christ as a real daily delight for you. And we've got three sessions to do that in. Three sessions to look at who Jesus is, what he's done, and last of all this afternoon, what he thinks of you right now. Okay? Who he is, what he's done, and what he thinks of you right now. Okay, so first of all, our first session, we're going to look at who he is. Now, let me just start by imagining something with you. Let us imagine, you can shut your eyes if you want, you'll be doing this later in the day anyway. Shut your, shut your eyes. Imagine for a minute a world where there is a God, there is a God, but he's not like Jesus. So in this world, people have spoken about God for, for years and years, but um, their talk about God isn't Jesus-shaped, of course. This God is not Jesus in any way. 
What might that world look like? There is a God, but he's nothing like Jesus. What might that world look like? I'll tell you what I think. I think it'd be the sort of world where people wouldn't want God. It'd be the sort of world where people would think that true pleasure is to be found away from God. I think it'd be the sort of world where on the sides of buses you'd read, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Because if God is not like Jesus, what is he like? Creator of all things, ruler of all, all all-powerful, but he's not a father loving his son. This is a Jesusless God, remember. Well, you don't actually have to think very hard to think what would God without Jesus look like because we see a Jesusless God in Allah. And what is Allah like? Allah is defined by his supremacy. Allah is absolutely supreme and above all things. And that's probably the most important thing to say about him. You know, that's precisely why so many people in the freedom of the West think, is there really no God? Phew. Because I don't want a God like that. I don't want a God whose prime concern is his own supremacy. A God who wants to call me away from pleasure to groveling before him to just saying how big he is. Why would I want a God like that? Oh, you sure, I'd have to serve him, but I wouldn't want to. Power and supremacy in themselves are not attractive. They're just intimidating. And you know, I don't think Christians have been great at responding to this. I think this is a good part of the trouble we're in right now in this country and in England. You see, I think a lot of Christians seeing that, we feel on the back foot that God has made so little of in the country. Christians react precisely by banging the drum of God's supremacy. So the world is saying God's irrelevant and we're saying You're saying God's irrelevant. No, God is big, I tell you. Big, big, big. And the world is thinking, but I don't want God to be big. This God sounds repulsive to me. It may be true, but I don't like it. And I will do anything I can to prove it's not true. Because I don't want some self-obsessed heavenly tyrant. A Stalin in the sky. I don't want such a being. What is good news about that? But Jesus is the bomb in our knowledge of God. Jesus blows apart everything we would have thought about God, completely changing our understanding of who and what God is like. Jesus changes everything. And I want us to see that today. Jesus shows us a very, very different sort of God. An infinitely better God. A God so good, so kind, that were the buses to hear of him, they'd have to say, there's probably no God. Now start worrying. For there could not be worse news if there's no God like him. The great reformer Martin Luther once said, God looked upon outside of Christ, that is without Christ, God looked upon outside of Christ is most dreadful and terrible. That is, he's saying, if you try to think of God without thinking of Jesus, you will imagine a horror. Why? Because, said Luther, 
Whoever seeks God outside of Christ seeks the devil. Why? Well, imagine a God who's all alone, all powerful, self obsessed. Yes, you're imagining the devil. Of course, people don't want such a God. Basically, people are thinking there's probably no devil. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Of course they don't want such a being. Let's see how different the God revealed by Jesus is. How very different and beautiful. Come with me to Exodus 33. You knew we were going to go there. Exodus 33, and we'll jump in at verse 7. Now, just so you know, the context is um, Israel just come out of Egypt. Uh, they're waiting around the bottom of Mount Sinai. And the first scene we're going to see is at the bottom of Mount Sinai in the Israelite camp. Exodus 33, verse 7. Now, Moses used to take the tent and he would pitch it outside the camp far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. Just skip on to verse 9. When Moses entered this tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. Verse 11, even more. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. As a man speaks with his friend. You see, when the Lord comes down to be with his people, then you can know him. In the tent of meeting, the Lord can be seen face to face. Just like years later, the Lord would come down to tabernacle with his people. And people could speak to the Lord face to face. As he walked around them, befriended them, befriending tax collectors and sinners. That is how God can be known when he comes down. But now, skip on to verse 18. Now the camera angle changes here, and we're now up at the top of Mount Sinai. It's a different moment, okay? Top of Mount Sinai, Moses says to the Lord, verse 18, Please show me your glory. And the Lord said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. But, get this, you cannot see my face. Eh? He's just seen the face of the Lord. Verse 11. And now, this person calls the Lord, says, you cannot see my face and live. Hmm. You can see the face of the Lord who comes down from heaven to be with his people who tabernacles with them. But no sinner may see the face of this Lord up there on the mountain. Verse 21. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I'll take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul speaks of the rock in Exodus. And he says, that rock was Christ the rock that poured forth living water in the desert, the rock of ages cleft for Moses. Hidden there, Moses could know God. Do you see, only in Christ the rock, only in Christ the Lord who comes down from heaven to tabernacle with his people, only in him can God be known and seen. He is the one who reveals his hidden father up on the mountain, up in heaven. And if you don't know God through Christ, 
well, how are you going to think of God? And we don't have to guess. All Israel is at the bottom of the mountain. How are they thinking of God? They're not seeing the Lord at the top of Sinai. How are they thinking of God? Previous chapter, chapter 32, tells you. They are building a golden calf and they are calling it the God who rescued them from Egypt. So they, the Israelites, they're imagining God is golden, horned, spectacular, strong, but nothing like the living God who proclaims himself to be merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Do you see, they just don't get that. They haven't seen that. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, is ever the Word of God. He is the one who, from the very beginning, from the days of Genesis, makes the living God known. If you try to think of God without him, without the Word of God, you will imagine a golden calf, a horned idol. But the sun is the bright light, the glory, the exact representation of his father's being. It's so like his father, is he, that when Philip says in John 14, show us the father, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. God is Jesus shaped. My father is just like me. And yes, the God that Jesus reveals is a Father, if you've got a deficient father, I'm sorry. If your father is rather cold, if you have a difficult relationship with your father, don't read that relationship into the meaning of the word father here. It's that fathers on earth are created, they're supposed to reflect what it means to be the father all loving, life-giving. But where some do that well, others do do a better job of reflecting the devil. And all us fathers are failures. Father means life-giving. By the very nature of the word, life-giving, loving, that's the God revealed by Jesus, the Son First and foremost, this God is all fatherly, all life-giving, loving. He's kind first, before there's any reason for him to be. Here's the thing, though. Only through Jesus could you know that. Only through Jesus could you know that God is so lovely, so good, so fatherly. Just imagine, just just try to think about God in the abstract. Think God. Could you know that that God was in any way attractive, good, kind? You couldn't know that, could you? You'd know power, perhaps. No more than that. Only in Jesus do you see what God is truly like. Fatherly. Jesus says, John 14, 6, I am the way to think about God, to get to know God. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is how you'll know what God is really like, through Jesus. Friends, thank you for listening to Delighting in the Trinity. We want to let you know about two new resources by Michael Reeves. The first is Authentic Ministry, Serving from the Heart. Authentic ministry is not simply a matter of mastering professional skills or of endlessly pouring oneself out in works of service. Rather, it springs from a joyful union with the heart of Christ. The second resource is Right with God, a little book on the center ground of the Christian faith, Justification by Faith. For anyone who does not know Christ or is lacking confidence in their salvation, The Bible has good news of comfort and joy. You can order your copy today at unionpublishing.org. 
Or come with me to, um, you knew John 14.6, come to Proverbs 30, which you might be slightly less familiar with. Proverbs 30. It's just after Psalms, right at the end of Proverbs. Proverbs 30. The words of Agur, son of Jacher, the oracle. The man declares, I'm weary, O God, I'm weary, O God, and worn out. Surely, interesting thing to say, I'm too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended to heaven? And who has come down from heaven? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? What a great question. If you don't know the name of the Lord, if you don't know his son's name, you simply don't know the lovely living God. And you'll be thinking of another God. You simply don't have knowledge of the Holy One. So, Christians, let's stop talking abstractly about God. Let's not speak of or defend any abstract God. Because people will imagine we're talking about a devilish God. Let's speak of the way, the truth and the life. The one who reveals to us the fatherly God. Actually, I I want to press in a bit here. Before we even get on to how we speak of God to others, can I ask you a question? You're not going to have to answer out loud so you can think whatever you want. How do you feel about God, really? Really? Uh, That might strike you as an odd question. How do you feel about God? It it could strike you as an odd question because you could think, well, to be honest, I've kind of put feelings aside. I know it is right that he be worshipped and served, and so I kind of got on with it and not really thought about how I feel about him. I just get on with that. Or I wouldn't be surprised if there are quite a few... And you wouldn't say it, probably. Perhaps you don't even quite dare think it, because it would be naughty. But if you're really honest, you don't really like God. The word God just conjures up slightly dark, off-putting, forbidding images for you. What I want to say to you, is that if you don't answer that question, how do you feel about God, by saying, do you know, Mike, I absolutely love him. He is my everything. If you don't answer like that, my friend, you have misunderstood him. And I want to try to help. You've misunderstood him. Come then to John 1. Because the vision that John gives is of such a happy, warming truth about God that if you get it, you'll find you can't simply get on with a Christian life, feelings aside. You can't see God as off-putting, boringly forgettable. In John 1, we start seeing, see God as he truly is. And you will only be able to find your heart one to him. That's my experience. So, John 1. In the beginning was the word. Now this word is Jesus, right? The word who, verse 14, became flesh. Now, what happens when God's word goes out? Can you think what he's referring to, in the beginning was the word, is echoing Genesis 1, right? And what happened when the word of God went out in Genesis 1? The word of God goes out and light 
shines into the darkness and drives all the darkness, the emptiness, the nothingness away. That's clearly what Jonathan's got on his mind. Verse 4. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so John is seeing that from page one of the Bible, our view of God just gets slapped in the face by the word of God. This completely flips on its head how we tend to think of God. Okay, here's how. Because I think we tend to think, okay, here's how we go through life. We tend to go through life thinking, okay, I've got life already. Right? I've got life, and if God's going to make an appearance in my life, he's going to be like an intrusion, a weight, a, a black cloud of moral burden on my life. I've got life, but God's presence is bringing, dare I say, darkness to my life. No, here we see it is without the word, without Jesus, that all is darkness and dreary emptiness. Friends, Jesus is not darkness. He is not an onerous, ominous, dark, forbidding God. No, he is all light, revealing a God who... 1 John 1 5, we see a God in whom there is no darkness at all in him. Like the sun in the sky, he is the light of the world, shining out life, goodness. Nothing to hide, no spots or blemishes on his character, nothing to make us go, oh, I wish that wasn't true about him. It's all beautiful. He warms, he gives life, he's pure, he does not bring the crushing coldness that religiosity would bring to your life. I don't want to interest you in formulas of various religions, but specifically in Jesus. Jesus comes to conquer all our darkness, everything that is of the night, death, pain, evil, suffering, He comes as the light of the world to drive them all away for our good. In verse 18, do you see, John writes, No one has ever seen God. No, they haven't. Moses realized that at the top of Mount Sinai. No one has ever seen the Father. They've seen the Son, of course, because Moses saw the Lord face to face. So, John has to qualify what he's seeing. Nobody has ever seen God, but Jesus, the only God, the only begotten, who is at the Father's side, has always made him known. Nobody has any idea what God is truly like, but Jesus makes the living Lord known. Jesus is the revelation of God. And if you have any other ideas of what God might be like, any dark Images of a tyrant in heaven. Fling them away. You're imagining a golden calf, an idol that doesn't exist. Jesus reveals the true God. Now we've got to a certain place here. What I've just said is always eternally true of this God. That light of loving goodness is something that's always been true. Always. And always will be. But, whilst from the day they were created, the angels enjoyed that light of God, one day, the sun showed something more in God. Showed something extraordinary. They'd seen his love, his light, his pure goodness. One day, the sun showed something that staggered even the angels who'd been before him. 
what I'm about to show you is something into which, as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1.12, even angels long to look. Come to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Let's um, go from verse 6. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Do you see, here is not a grasping, greedy God, all concerned with his own greatness. Absolutely not. He made himself nothing. That's how he reveals himself. He makes himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Think who this is. For this one, if, if he had come down to be the greatest emperor the world had ever seen, that would be humble for him. That would be unspeakably humble for him, for he is greater than the greatest emperor this world has ever known. But no, he humbles himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. That is what he's like. This God does not come to be served, but to serve. God comes to serve us. That reveals what he's like. Not a proud God at all. No, pride is the devil's brat. But the Son of God is all self-giving generosity, humility. You want to know what God is like? Look at the baby in the manger. Look at the man befriending sinners. Look at the man going out to eat with the outcasts. That's the living God. Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he good? Do you remember? Do you remember that time in Isaiah 6? Isaiah sees a vision of the Lord. Seated on his heavenly throne and the angels, the angels, the seraphim, are flying round him crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Remember? But you don't really know what that holiness means. At that point when they're doing that, he is high and lifted up. That's the phrase. High and lifted up. And they cry holy. You don't know what it means, that holiness. You don't know what it means until the next time in Isaiah he is said to be explicitly high and lifted up. Do you know when the next time is? It's Isaiah 52 and 53. When he's high, lifted up, and he's pierced for our transgressions. Crushed for our iniquities, lifted up on the cross. There you see the holiness of the living Lord. There you see what he's really like. His holiness is a description of his character, what he's really like. That's what his holiness is like. Self-giving, humble generosity. Not looking down his nose, holiness. And that is what even angels long to appreciate. And in that moment, when Jesus is lifted up on the cross, when he most perfectly revealed what he is like, do you remember what it looked like? Do you remember? When he's there, what did it look like? There was a sign over his head. It was written in Aramaic, in Greek, and in Latin. So all the world could see 
Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This is our king. This is what he's like. The crowds don't get it. Here he is lifted up. They don't get it. The angels gasp. They can hardly get it. This is what he's like. Giving himself away, dying to give life to others. The thief cries, remember me. He begins to get it. This is our king, our God. You want to know what God is like? Look at the cross. And there you see that God is humble. God is humble. We so quickly cast visions of what we think God would be like every day, don't we? You imagine God. Look again at the cross each day. This is what the living God's like. Not like what you were expecting. God is humble. Now, he's, he's not weak. Oh, no. Not weak at all. It is that... His self-giving love is so intense that he serves. He gives himself away. On the cross, you see a God who is so good, so kind, so gentle, so caring. There's no shiftiness in his eyes, no pomposity, no cruelty whatsoever in him. On the cross, you see a God who is love covered over with flesh. A God who is not about taking from us as if he were in need of something, but a God who is so overflowing with love and goodness and life that he gives to us. He gives himself away. He gives his life away. On the cross, you see a God who's so good, he'd wage war on death, on everything you hate, On the cross, you see a God so powerful, he'd slaughter it. The old 17th century preacher, Stephen Charnock, said, Is not this God, the Father of lights, the supreme truth, the most delectable object? Is he not light without darkness, love without unkindness, goodness without evil, purity without filth, All excellency to please, without a spot to distaste, are not all other things infinitely short of him. Charnock is expressing what those who've got to know God know. That there are many gorgeous things in this world. From the smell of a flower to the love of a family. But this God is the author of all gorgeousness. Everything that is purely delightful is his imagination and expression of his loveliness. If you love that food, you think, well, that tells you about the nature of this God. He's the sort of God that is delightful. He is the beauty behind all beauty, the joy behind all joy. He's the music behind all music, the life behind all life, which is why the psalmist could say, Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven beside you? And there is nothing else on earth I desire beside you. When you see the Lord for who he truly is, That you can say sincerely. For this God is the fountain of everything desirable. My question is, how could Charnock speak so warmly of God then? How could he say those things? Because he was absolutely explicit that the way to know the living God is through Christ. So Charnock goes on, he says. 
nothing of God looks terrible in Christ to a believer. Nothing of God looks terrible in Christ to a believer. The sun is risen. Shadows are vanished. God walks upon the battlements of love. Justice has left its sting in a saviour's side. The law is disarmed. Weapons out of his hand. His bosom open, his bowels yearn, his heart pants. Sweetness and love is in all his carriage. And this is life eternal. To know God believingly in the glories of his mercy and justice in Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the word, the son who reveals to us an altogether different God. A surprising God. A God who's altogether lovely. A God who loves to be kind. A God who is against all that is wrong. A good God of pure light and humble, self-giving love. That's what he's like. And if today we are to be drawn, weaned away from jaded, anxious thoughts of God. If we're to be won away from a love of those sins that trap us. We need such a knowledge of Christ to see he is better, more desirable truly than that thing that enslaves you. We don't just need God. The world's antagonism to the idea of God shows that very clearly. We need Jesus. We don't just need the Bible. The Bible is there to teach us of Jesus, to win us to him. But there are many people who read their Bible and they don't know Jesus. That was true of the Jews in Jesus' day. And it's true of many today. And I'm not just talking about the JWs. Okay, here's the thing. My fear, my fear is that the church today is really very like the churches in Revelation. Do you remember? Revelation 2 and 3. Full of Christian talk, Christian activity. But Christ is outside, knocking. And so, today I hear a lot about God's great plans. I hear a lot of talk about grace talk about the gospel and all through it we can forget Christ as if there's some gospel to be had without him as if there's something other than the grace of Jesus there's, grace is something in itself the gospel is something in itself there is no such thing as grace there is no such thing as the gospel there's the gospel of Jesus Christ the, the grace of Jesus And if we're not clear on which God we're talking about, how's the world going to act? And in fact, it's not just the world who's going to react badly and think of a devilish God. We are going to start imagining a horned idol, a golden calf, instead of the living God. There is no Christianity without Christ Not just Christ as one brick in the structure. Christ as the cornerstone. Christ as the center. Christ as the one object of saving faith. Christ as the definition of God and the gospel. But if we believe that, what a God will have. A God who stretches out his arms to us. A God who washes us and wins us. And this is life eternal. To know God believingly in the glories of his mercy in Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
our Father, all your glories shine so splendidly through your Son. In him you reveal yourself to be unsurpassedly desirable. And I pray now, move us by your spirit to look to him. Today and in the future, when we feel guilty and dread the thought of God, to look to him. When we feel cold and unmoved by the thought of God, to look to him. And so make us a people who say, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing else on earth that I desire beside you. And so make us a people who herald to the world a God it had never dreamed of. Blessed be your lovely name, our Father. In Jesus we pray. Amen. You've been listening to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our School of Theology equips leaders for ministry. Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalization. And Newton House, Oxford, invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy union books, to discover support for your church plant, or to become a friend of union and support our ministry, visit www.theola.gy.